Okay, rather than take a, a question for myself like I usually do uh, as a, the, the kind of the anchor on, on this uh, Friday show, I want to actually follow up to something they said that I think is very astute. It is freedom that is under attack. Freedom has always been under attack by the people in power because freedom for you means less power from them. But it seems like freedom is under greater attack today than it has been for a very long time. There's there's two reasons, and the second one is the one I want to key in on. The first one is because in some ways there's more freedom today than there ever has been in some ways. That's very scary because that means that there's been a sliding loss of control. Now, there's a lot of dumbed-down people in society that are still easily controlled. Even though they have access to freedom, they choose not to use it. This is what keeps the oligarchs and the plutocrats and the, 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 the elected officials happy for now. But they see the writing on the wall, which brings me to the second reason that freedom is under such attack right now. Vin Armani and I talked about it this week. The state, as an entity, across the developed world, has grown so large and so bloated that its only purpose at this point is to survive, to maintain itself, to not lose. If we look at a lot of what governments are doing now, you're passing redundant laws, you're passing redundant bills, you're not repealing anything. They, there, there's really nothing left to, to regulate. If I had gone into a different direction with the history segment today, you learn about things like the Clean Water Act and things like that that all happened in the, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, right now, some of these environmental regulations that Trump wants to pull back and, and let companies have a little bit more breathing room, everybody's screaming, the water will be on fire again, and shit like that. Well, he wants to repeal shit that Obama did. Okay, what cleaned up all these rivers was the Clean Water Act and other things that were done in the 60s and 70s and early 80s. See, that fixed the problem. That was where government actually stepped up and fixed a problem. Maybe not the best way they could have, but... Uh, even I, as a voluntarist, have to admit that what was done was better for the environment. All this shit that was lumped on 30 years later is not necessary. We didn't have rivers on fire in 2000, you know, 2007, and then Obama came in and fixed it. And there's just everywhere you go, every area you look at in government, it's more, more, more when... If we didn't need it 10 years ago, why do we need it today? And with technological you know, evolution, there's some answers to that, but a lot, a lot of places there's not. There's just not an answer to why we need something today we didn't have 10 or 20 years ago if everything in that world has been okay for the last 10 or 20 years. So the state is seeking to survive, which brings me to the, the, the turning point in all of this. They are being made irrelevant. And hence, they must attack the things that make them irrelevant. They must attack the things that make them irrelevant. And one of the things that has made the state far more irrelevant in the minds of so many people in the last 10 years specifically is the growth and success of homeschooling. There's a lot of other things, like cryptocurrencies. And if you start to think about what's going on out there and put it all together, so what's happened is if you had told somebody in 1980 we do not need the government to run a public education system. It can be done without them. You would have had about a 99.9% .9 chance that, that person would have thought you were crazy. Let's say that today 20% of the people in the country can at least look at that statement and say, well, maybe there's some merit to it. Maybe the state doesn't need to be so... Do you understand how big that is? See, do you, it's not just about the total number. It's the momentum and the direction the wind is blowing. And with the continued evolution of technology, it is going to be such that children will be able to get a better education faster with no quote-unquote schooling at all. There'll be lots of learning, lots of education, lots of uh, interactivity, but there doesn't ever have to be any framework called schooling over it. It's not necessary. Now, consider what percent of the United States government's total spending is in the education sector and the, the government-guaranteed uh, loan component of that into even the private sector of education. How many bureaucrats 
How many government employees can go away if we can just take away 20% of what the, 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 the public sector is doing, the government sector is doing in regards to education? Of course you're scared if you're a superintendent of a school district and, hey, all of these homeschoolers around you being educated by these country bumpkins are smarter than the kids coming out of your school. And you realize that we haven't even really begun to tap what technology can do for education yet. And that if I use technology as my primary tool for education, I don't need your building, I don't need your infrastructure, I don't need your rules, I don't need you telling me when my, my, I can have access to my child. I don't need that anymore. But it's not just school, is it? What if you told somebody in 1985, you know what we could do? We could create our own money. And they say, oh, you mean because we're silver bugs and gold. You're like, you silver, right? Oh, no, silver sucks for money. It's It's heavy. It has risk of being stolen during transportation. You know, if you put it into any kind of electronic thing, the government has total visibility and access to it. No, I mean, we could create our own money, basically like a credit-based system, where people can exchange credits with each other of some sort, and it'll all be done electronically, and it can either be very public or very private. And you say, well, where will this currency get its value? And you said, well, what we'll do is we'll set up a system where people have to use math to, 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 to mine out each credit. And there'll be a certain number of credits over a certain period of time. And that way, it won't be counterfeitable. And they explained it basically the way that Bitcoin works today. And, the, and then you know what they would have said? Well, what backs it? Where does it get its value? And you say, well, when it's exchanged within the economy between people who will accept it, currency actually derives its value from the economy, not from some mythical thing that a gold bar or a government promise backs it. That money is really based on the value of its ability to be exchanged. And what controls it and makes it stable is a cap on the total quantity. That's all we really need is a cap on the total quantity and assurance that the transactions are safe and secure and reliable and an assurance that it can't be counterfeited. If we just had all that, we could have our own money. We don't need government to make money anymore. We don't need debt to make money. We don't need gold to make money. We can just agree upon a framework and then the economy will set the value of the money. They would have thought you were nuts. They would have said, oh, you're going to be like Zimbabwe and the, the Weimar Republic and you print money and you can't do that. And, uh, but what do we have today? Anybody that understands Bitcoin, Ether, Ethereum, Dogecoin, all these other cryptocurrencies today, when you tell them we don't need government to create money and we don't need a metal to make money either, that we can actually do what they've been doing for 100 years better and value for value exchange sets the value of the exchange token, they, they go, of course we don't need government to do that. Look, it works fine right here. It works fine right here. And well, people will say, well, it, it only works because you can swap it into dollars. Go ask the average Bitcoin user how often they exchange their Bitcoin for dollars. Why would I? Why would I? I'm holding... A deflationary currency. Why would I put my money from a deflationary currency into an inflationary currency? Translation, I'm holding a currency that in spite of volatility over time gains value because it has to, because math says so. And you're using a currency that loses value over time and it has to because math and the plan of your government says so. The dollar cannot become worth more over 10 years. It has to become less. We call it inflation. And it's actually a financial disaster for this country because of the way it's run if it does become stronger. So you know they won't let it. And you're holding a currency with a fixed total final value that's only being used by about 1% of the world right now. If 2% of the world decided to use Bitcoin tomorrow, it would quadruple in price because it has to due to availability. But there'd never be a shortage because it's infinitely fungible into fractions. So we've now taken away the need of the government to provide an education and to provide a monetary system. You think freedom's going to be under attack? Do you understand the world you're living in today? And then we look at something um, like, like Swarm City, and I, I think Ethereum is the next level of cryptocurrency. I really do. 
because it can do things Bitcoin cannot. It's the next generation. And it can help others create their own currencies backed by it, which is exactly what I said we needed four years ago to create the concept of virtual nations. And Swarm City's doing this with their Swarm City token, where people can exchange value for value of service and things like that and swap that token inside a closed system that your government can't even conceive of. Can't even conceive of. Where you can put hashtag roof. It's not available yet. This is what they're building. You just put hashtag roofing in your app, boom, and it's geocentric. And people that are willing to do roofing within Swarm City start making, you know, sh saying they'll come to give you a bid or whatever. And when they finish the work, you give them the Swarm City tokens of the amount that were agreed upon. There's a contract, and you and the roofer both gain trust within the system so that you are now more trustworthy. And now, what else do we not need? Well, I don't need the government to tell me whether this roofer is trustworthy or not. He can't even do business in the system without either negatively or positively affecting his trust. It is impossible for him to do business in this system without developing a track record that shows whether or not he's trustworthy. So now we're, we're, we're talking about getting rid of the need to have things like licenses and government certifications because the market can tell... Why do you think freedom is under attack? Do you even understand, audience, do you even understand that we are standing at a precipice of making massive amounts of government unnecessary, irrelevant, extinct? Extinct. Now, I want you to think about this. If your existence was threatened... Don't think like government, just you personally. If your existence was threatened, how hard would you fight to maintain your right to exist? Now, here's the thing. You, as a being, have a right to exist. The state has no right to exist. You could argue for the need for a state or the value of a state, but you cannot argue for the right to of the state to exist. It has no rights. It is to be instituted by men and women to protect the rights of men and women. That is the purpose of a state. It says so in our founding documentation. Okay? We've lost our way from that, but that is what this na our nation was founded on a singular belief, a true singular belief, that governments were instituted to protect the rights of the citizens of the state. That's the only reason they exist. It was a revolutionary idea at the time, and one that fell away because the state will always grow. And the state has been able to grow so effectively for so long because of perceived need until technology began to enable us to replace what we thought we needed with something that works better and is more fair and more impartial. Contract resolution. On these Ethereum networks, if I have a contract with you, the blockchain is a truth teller. We'll know who told the truth and who lied in our interactions. And we'll have trust. If I've screwed over everybody I've ever worked with and you decide to give me a chance and now it looks like I've screwed you too and you have perfect trust records from everybody else, who's an arbitrator going to side with? Oh, gee, are we starting to negate the, the need for at least part of a criminal justice and a civil justice system, too? Yeah. Freedom's under attack because freedom's on the rise. Freedom's on the rise. That's a good way to end the week, to realize that's what's really going on, and that's why they're afraid. That's why they're afraid. I'll end with a quote. Not my favorite person, but he said a few things right, and this was one of them. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Think about the rise of cryptocurrency. Ignored, then mocked and laughed at, especially by the precious metal people who were on the same side of the liberty fight we were. Ah, uh, because they couldn't understand it. Then the full court press against Bitcoin. And then all of a sudden, 
tax guidance for how to pay taxes on it and an approval that you can actually contribute to a political candidate in Bitcoin. And people are like, Bitcoin? <laughs> you guys don't understand anything. You guys don't understand anything. We're already in the next generation of this stuff. Bitcoin's just a store of value. We're building something that replaces you. Then they fight you. And then you win. Especially when they choose to engage in the fight. Final thought. Generally speaking, if the person, if both parties are prepared, the person that attacks loses. The attacking first only works when your opponent's not prepared. When your opponent's prepared, you usually give up something in the attack. You give up something that allows them to react. And in the reaction, they're able to use your attack and your momentum against us, against you. Now, if your opponent's not prepared, so stay prepared, my friends. Stay prepared.